It's a couple of days together. We've all been stuck. I've been locked down, so I'm now out. So now I'm out, and we're gonna. You ain't putting me back. So great to great to minister again. I'm, I'm trying to get to the emphasis here on this on the kingdom vision in times of chaos is what we're talking. And I, I want to just talk about some of the. I'm nervous to use the word keys, but keys to the key, to kingdom ministry. I think we've all in this season had to relook at a whole lot of stuff and a whole lot of shaking God's doing. And I think we've got to come back to what really matters, kingdom ministry that matters. Amen. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's an honest discussion through Scripture, the lenses of Scripture, not through culture, not through Americanisms, through the Word of God. And actually what matters is what we need to get back to. And if we are involved in other stuff, I want to be bold enough to say, stop doing it. Yeah. Um, this is a time to take stock and to get on with the plans and the purposes of God. And as I said, God never stopped what He's doing through this pandemic. He paused what we're doing, in a sense, to remind us again of what He is doing and to bring us back to what He's doing. And also to remind us that apart from Him, we can do nothing. And so we're not just getting on with our ministries and hoping God's in it. He's brought us back to His ministry, walking and working in His plans. He's about the kingdom. I, I think we often... Many people lose their way when they lose their why. I think that many people have lost. Hey, buddy, good to have you back. Welcome, and nice shoes. And <clears throat> but I, I do want to say that I think people are losing their way because they've lost their why. When we come back to the why we do what we do, and why the church should be functioning is not for the church, not for a ministry, not for a pastor or a leader, actually for the kingdom. Amen. And that's what we were talking about earlier. The kingdom is in the church, and the church is in the kingdom, but the kingdom is not the church. Uh, Church is not the kingdom. We're the agency through which His kingdom comes. That's what Jesus said. I'm giving you keys, Matthew 16, to this kingdom. Not, uh, keys, not, uh, it's, the keys are not to the kingdom. The keys of the kingdom. And so we, in a sense, get to, can I say, advance kingdom here on earth. Amen. In other words, He's entrusted us with the advancing. and Not the leaders, the church, Amen. to advance the, ad, the kingdom of God, to administrate His kingdom here on earth. Which means we are about the rule and reign of God. That's what we were talking about. And we tried to get there earlier. So good leaders have influence. Great leaders have impact. I don't want to just influence. I want to impact. And I think that's something of what the kingdom is about. Which means we need to be a people of purpose, which I shared last night. Keep purpose in front of you. God's purpose is God's plan. We, 2020's lesson was we planned, but God prevailed. Right? In other words, we need to have plans, but we need to actually stick to the purposes of God. And so please lead with purpose. Live with purpose. And I tried to share that last night. And uh, may I just maybe just touch again on the prophetic. I think why prophets have prophesied at times the wrong things in this last season. I'm not having a go at prophets. But I think when we lose purpose, then we begin to prophesy all sorts of things. That's why I believe prophets and apostles need to work together. That's what the Bible says. Apostles and prophets, they lay the foundation. Because apostles, in a sense, bring the revelation of Christ and the purpose to which we've been called. And when you prophesy into purpose, then we have a function for why we're prophesying into the things of God. But when we just prophesy who's winning elections and who's going to do this and who's going to do that, we like that, but it has no purpose to it. And we all just say whatever we want. And so again, if you are prophetic, please prophesy. We need the prophets to speak, but they need to be linked to the purposes of God, not just to an outcome of an election yeah. or what we want or what we require. What's the purpose of God? It's always purpose. Live with purpose. Lead with purpose. In the season, what's God doing? No, what are we doing? What's God been doing? And I try to talk about that last night. So have purpose. Be secondly prophetic. We don't only need the prophets. We are all prophetic. How many of you believe you're prophetic? You know, we've limited prophetic to an office. And we see that in Scripture. Ephesians chapter 4, Jesus gave gifts to the church. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Their job is not to do the job, but to equip the saints to do the job. So, and then actually ultimately to get us to grow up. Ultimately, the, the, the true apostolic, true call of a translocal team is not to just equip people, but it's actually to get them to equip, to be equipped to actually grow up. Maturity is the goal of those gifts, not ministry. We are so ministry savvy as the church in America, but we are so immature as the church in America. Why is that? Because we've made ministry the, 
the emphasis rather than maturity. And so this season's revealed some of the immaturity and brought us back to growing up as well as ministering. So our job is to equip you to do the job, not you cheer us on as we go and do it. Translocal ministry is, exists for the local church to do. The, the local church doesn't exist for the translocal ministry. Does it make sense? You don't buy into my ministry for what I'm doing around the world. God, Jesus gave these gifts to the church for the church. We buy into what you're doing. We invest in you so you will fulfill your mission as the local church. It's a different. We don't need you. You need us and we need you. Partnership in the gospel. And that's why Paul thanked God for the partnership he had, not just in ministry, in the gospel, getting the gospel to the outermost parts of the earth. You can't do it alone. God made it like that. Even if you're the most gifted, most anointed with the most people, every dime and every dollar is in your bank account, you still can't do it alone. God says, I want you to work together with these gifts who come into your church to equip you to go and be who God's called you, but ultimately to grow up. And so we need purpose, and it's about purpose, and it's also about being prophetic. So yes, there's the gift of the prophet, but there's also, I, I mean, the office of a prophet. There's also gifts of prophecy, that we all can prophesy at times, and, and then we see that. I got stuck saying this, and I missed it, but Romans 12, God gave gifts to the church. we are all being given gifts through Romans 12. And I said this earlier, before we were saved, we used those gifts, Romans Chapter 12, we use those gifts, gift of service, gift of leadership. We use them for our glory. Yeah. Then when we get saved, we actually begin to use them for His glory. Amen. Those are God-given gifts. Then they're Christ-given gifts. Ephesians chapter 4, Jesus in His ascension, He gave gifts to the church for the church. And then in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, and 14, they are the Holy Spirit gifts. And these gifts are given to the church by the Holy Spirit, that manifestation of His presence and gifts of tongues and interpreted prophecy, all this stuff we see. Friends, we need all of those gifts. Amen. And I know it's something weird for some of us, but we need that. That's kingdom ministry. We've been given these gifts. And, and so, but we are all prophetic. And prophetic in its simplicity means to see the future, prepare for it, and become it. Amen. How can you be pre preparing and becoming something you haven't seen? We live for the future. There's no history in our past. I mean, there's no future in our past. There, that's why we, we can't be nostalgic for an era we no longer live in. There's no pre-COVID for the church. We are over COVID, through COVID, into a whole new season. Don't be nostalgic for what's no longer existing. Live in the now, in the season. The doors that have closed, let them be closed. And God is a great door opener, but He's a great door closer. Revelation chapter, he says, he actually says in the book of Revelation, I close doors that no man can open, and I open doors that no man can close. We love the door opener, but we don't like the cl door closer, God. But he closes doors in order to open doors. Amen. And if we try to go back and kick doors down that were open before, he's closed them, they're not opening. We've got to look for the doors that lay ahead for the open doors and walk through those doors. I love that book of Revelation. Four doors. We've said it before. Do I, I, I shut doors that no man can close, open. I, close, I open doors that no man can shut. That's great. Then it says in uh, Revelation chapter 3, Behold, I stand at the door of your heart and I knock. And he's not talking to the sinners. He's talking to the church. He's knocking. And do you know that's the only door that he can't open. It's the only door we get to open to him. Yet we want all these other doors while he's knocking on the door of our hearts. I stand at the door of your heart and knock. Open the door for him to come in and fellowship and draw close as we talked about last night. And then there's this fourth door. I looked up, Revelation chapter 4, I looked up and I saw an open heaven above me. Now, I know that means many things, but I just do believe we've got to believe in this season. That if we're on the mission of God, if we're about the kingdom of God, about the king's business, then we have an open heaven. We've got the backing of heaven above us. Amen. The provision and the protection and the strategy and the anointing. and it's, We don't operate like earthly people. The doors that are open for us at the church in this nation, it's going to be a people relying on Him, not getting good at our strategies and brainstorming again. It's God saying, you've got the backing of heaven. Do you believe that? Not just the preacher, not me here this morning standing. We, the church, have the backing of heaven. 
You might not have your president's backing or the government's backing or even your church, but we've got the backing of God Amen. and the provision and be an open heaven. Doors closed, doors open, doors of your heart and open heaven. How can we go wrong? Amen. But we better be about God's business, not ours. Because ministries are not coming back. The kingdom is standing strong. Amen. And so we need to be those people who are prophetic. We also need to keep pioneering. Honestly, friends, and we talked a bit last night, it's a season to pioneer, to occupy, to possess, not to be passive, not to wait out the storm, wait for COVID, wait for the next election, wait for whatever the next thing is. God's doing things now. Amen. And He's requiring of His church to get involved in His kingdom business. Don't be passive, occupy, possess. You know, when maintenance or holding ground is how decisions are made, how leaders are chosen, how ministries are led, money's used, prayers are prayed, and meetings are led, then the church's days are numbered. They're over. So I challenge leaders, pastors here today, don't lead your people through maintenance and waiting at out mode. Don't release leaders for now. Release them for the future. Don't look to what you've got. Look to what God's called you to do. I hope we see that. We need a kingdom-shaped view of the church, not a church-shaped view of the kingdom. The church is in the kingdom, and the kingdom is in the church, but the church is not the kingdom. We are that agency. You know, I, I, I just want to say that most of us would say we're about the kingdom. Absolutely, Tyler. But I would suggest that maybe most of us are about the church. And we need to shift our focus. Yes. We don't get rid of the church, but we get the agency, the church back in focusing on the kingdom. That's what God's about. Well, how do you know if you're about? Well, let me say, if you're church focused, it's all about growth. If you're kingdom focused, it's about impact. There's a big difference. The early church was obsessed with reach, not growth. If you're church focused, it's all about addition. Put more people and get more. If you give our kingdom, it's multiplication. It's different. If you're church focused, straight up, it's about getting. If you're kingdom focused, it's about giving. If you're church focused, it's about keeping. If you're, church, if you're kingdom focused, it's about releasing. If you're church focused, here we're going to get in trouble. We goal orientated. We set goals and we're all about our goals. That's church focus. Kingdom focus is Christ orientated. Very different. We're church focused, well, it's shakable. We've seen that. Yeah. If we're kingdom focused, it's unshakable. If we're church focused, it's about branding. If we're kingdom focused, it's about glorifying. Amen. If we're church focused, it's about we, we will always be under pressure. I mean, I've watched leaders, and if you're church focused, you carry pressure. It's pressure to perform, pressure to get, pressure, pressure. We live under pressure. And I've had the privilege of leading a few churches in my Past and no doubt into our future. And I'm telling you, friends, when you focus on church, your pressure, you're under pressure all the time. Yeah. But when you're kingdom focused, you're about his presence. Amen. When you're church focused, it's about excellence. When you're kingdom focused, it's about authenticity. Yeah. If you're church focused, we want to fill the buildings. If we're kingdom, we're about filling the earth. If you're church focused, about control. You know, you can either structure the church for growth or control, but you can't do it for both. Choose. Do you want to control or grow? Kingdom's about growth. It's about order, not control. See, I, I think we confuse the two. We want to control. We want to take control. We allow people to do this and don't allow people. We try. That's church focus. Kingdom focus is where God brings order and then we free people to go and be who God's called them to be. Church implodes eventually. Kingdom empowers. Church is all about gathering. Kingdom's about going. Church is about staying. Kingdom's about sending. Church is all about leaders of the church. Kingdom is about church leaders in the world. Church is about pleasing her. Kingdom is about pleasing him. Very big difference. 
Hebrews 12, 28, Therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, let us be thankful and so worship God acceptably with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Colossians chapter 1, 13, For He has rescued us from the dominion of darkness, from the, the destruction and the power of darkness. From sin, He's rescued us from, He's rescued us from and delivered us from sin and washed us clean, but He's also broken the power of sin in our life. Amen. We've been rescued from the domain of darkness. And what has happened? He's brought us not into the church, into the kingdom Amen. of the Son He loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sin. We've been saved out of and we've been saved into. And of course the church, and we are the church, and we're part of the church, but it's not about the church, but the kingdom. My pops always used to teach us it's more important what you get saved into than what you've got saved out of. And we talk so much about what we got saved. Before Christ, I was a radical sinner. I was a hell's angels. I was a druggie. I was this, that, and the other. Then I got saved. And then now I'm just a churchgoer bored and waiting for the return of Jesus. Whoa! We need to talk more about what we're into than what we've come out of. That's the kingdom. We've got to come back not just to church stuff, to kingdom. We're part of an unshakable kingdom. We've been rescued from that life, but brought into something way more important. Amen. That's why it matters who we are, because people in this season, there's a harvest for, I'm telling you, for, for Texas. Amen. I mean, listen, my wife just was like, geez, Texas is always featured on the news right now. What's going on there? And she just said, you know, sorry, I believe that's a harvest time for Texas. Yeah. Amen. I, I'm like, I'm here to tell you, it is harvest time for America. People are more open. I know they're anti-church, but they are open to Jesus. They've tried church, but they've never experienced Jesus. There's harvest time, my dear friends. Those people around there, everything that can be shaken has been shaken. And when things are shaken, people ask questions. And we can't get them to join our church. We've got to tell them about the unshakable one called Jesus. Don't come here, my pastor. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Amen. Let me tell you about this kingdom we're a part of. And how can you live and be so happy in it? Because in it all, we know what it happens at the end. We know who wins. And it's difficult, but it's there for us. Rescued from and brought into. Matthew 6, Seek first His kingdom and His righteousness, and all this other stuff will be added. Romans 14, 17. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking but of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because anyone who serves Christ in this way is pleasing to God and receives human approval. What is the kingdom? The rule and reign. Kingdom vision in the midst of chaos. Come back to the kingdom. Shaking everything that can be shaken. We're about the king and his kingdom. That's what it's about if you want to be on what God's doing. What is the kingdom? The rule and reign. Wherever God rules and reigns, that's the kingdom. Not some mystified trickery thing out there. And Jesus spoke a lot about the kingdom because that's his message. The gospel of the kingdom. Not just the good news. The good news of the kingdom. The context of the gospel is kingdom, not just some message. And let me tell you again, what we win people with is what we win people to. And if we're winning them with a gospel of the church, they're getting one into the church and we all being shaken and they're falling away. Sifted away. But the gospel of the kingdom. I want to be part of something that cannot be shaken. That's bigger than anything here on earth. The kingdom of God is an upside down kingdom. Jesus came as a servant king to win the hearts of people. Someday he will return as the absolute king of every kingdom and nation. But this is an upside down kingdom and we better stay upside down. We've got too worldly to win the world. We so much like them, we don't know what the difference is. That's not kingdom. You know that the people couldn't accept Jesus because he came in a way they could not accept. His own people rejected him because he came riding on a donkey, born in a manger, came like nothing they expected, like nothing as an earthly king would. He came purposefully to be different because there's nothing like this kingdom here on earth. But guys, we get so close. We live on the edge. And I'm not saying let's not be relevant, but let's be kingdom relevant. We become so uh, worldly relevant, there's no kingdom. Yeah. Then God has to shake and we all wonder why the whole ministry is falling apart. Because we are worldly trying to win the world with the world. Yeah. 
for me. I'm telling you the reason I came to Jesus, because my life was turned upside down by Jesus. I didn't want more added of what I had. I wanted something so different. And somehow I brought in as a leader and as a pastor into the life of the devil that we just play the game. We sandal next to them. We outdo the world and do a little better so they can choose us. Jesus says, I'll just shake them. It's all coming down. My kingdom will stand. It's an upside down kingdom. Keep it upside down. Don't make it relevant. It is so different yet so attractive. And America, Texas needs upside down kingdom. Not overthrow government, not re-election, another election. Upside down kingdom like nothing that is a man honoring, that is king honoring. It's a grassroots kingdom. Jesus came for every man. You know those people we think are irrelevant? And we do. I do too. I walk past and go, oh, another homeless guy. Just being honest. Like more homeless. Jeez, they're a pain. Why don't you just put them on the bus and send them to Colorado? That's what you want to do. Denver. <laughs> Just put them on the bus to Denver. You've done that before. You know that, right? Someone, Nashville, they put them all and send them to us. Thank you. I'm not sure, but it's like we just move them around because we don't like them. Like Jesus came for them. Somehow we've got to shift. Maybe we don't like what they do, but he, he matters. They matter. Even if they were the only ones on this planet, Jesus still would have come. And Jesus would have connected with them. Don't feel bad. Just love everyone. Yeah, Others of you are all about them and... Rich people are horrible. No, no, all people are good. Amen. God came for all of them, and you better minister to all of them because our season is everybody's need. It's grassroots. He came for every man and every woman, the poor, the broken, the least, and the lost of society. He came for them too. They matter. And if they matter to our king, they best matter to us. It's a salt and light kingdom. Jesus pres- uh, preserves goodness in society through the lives and members of his kingdom. I mean, this is going to shock you. You want to know the true uh, strength or quality of a nation? Look at the church. We blame government. We do. And, and we have the right to, but that's not what God's looking to. You want to know the true problem out there? It's because we have the problem as a church. We should be the solution, never the government. I, mean, I just don't see God saying, I'm going to use the government. I wish he did, because then we could really vote. I'm not saying well, government's irrelevant. I'm just telling you, God never said through government. He said through my church. It's not government's job to take care of the poor. It's ours. And not just give them a dime and flick them a thing and buy them a coffee. Care for them, restore them, give them dignity. It's the church's responsibility. Yes, good, the government's doing it, but we have a role. God looks to people who take care of the poor, and He answers their prayer. He favors the people who take care of His people. When did I do this for you, Lord? You did that for the least of these. You've done it for me. Where's that? Still in the context of Scripture, kingdom. Not just about other nations, which I talked about first. It's our nation, our lost people. We care. And I know I get in trouble saying this. We care more about animals in our country than we do about people. And I'm telling you, Christians too. You see a stray dog out there, you will pick that dog up, wash it, find those parents, or find its owners. If you don't, you'll keep it. We walk over people made in the image of God to get to that dog and not even care about them. Oh, they smell. I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I'm trying to give the context. The world's winning the battle because we make people irrelevant when animals matter more. According to my Bible, they don't. Man was made in the image of God, not animals. I'll just stop there. But we have lost our minds, America. We travel with dogs and cats. I don't even want to start with all that stuff. I'm not saying they're bad. They just are not going to heaven with you just so you know. That's, they matter and they're important. And if you abuse animals, you're in trouble. But we can shoot people, kill babies. And the outrage is in our hearts. We don't even care anymore. But don't you dare touch a dog, yeah. a cat. We'll speak out. Who did that? Our culture. Just telling us it's okay, it's okay. But Jesus says, I come from everyone. Amen. Everyone. Kingdom says everyone. Amen. I've been in your city. I went and had Terry Black's, the best barbecue in the world. 
But I'm telling you, even just sitting there, we had homeless dudes running at us and shouting at us and screaming at us. And Marco is cussing at us. And I'm like, he wasn't, they were. Marco's like, it's okay. And I'm like, gee, this is tragic. We get so used to it. It happens. They're on meth. I don't know what to do. It better break your heart because he is not happy. Oh, well, it's just the culture. No, no, help. Do something. Care at least. At least just be moved. Not to don't do something. Just care rather than, gee, look at that poor dog. Let me take it home. It's an incarnation kingdom. Jesus lived among people. So members of the kingdom of God live among people. We're not this holy huddle holding out and waiting for the return of Christ. We're not getting together on Sundays or having an equip to prepare us to be stronger, to hold on. We mix even with those who are not part of this kingdom. Why? To influence them and impact them into this kingdom for this king. Because he wants to come back for all people. This COVID thing has forced us to isolate and stay away and mask up and don't go near people and avoid people. And when you're walking in the mall, don't even go near the mall. Stay away. Get in, get out, hide. And I get it. But I'm telling you, there's a strategy behind it. And we can play into it by avoiding people when we call to actually connect with people. It's a transformational kingdom. Jesus came to transform the world back to how he intended the world to be. Amen. He didn't just say, oh, well, go for it. He put a rescue plan, as I said, from the book of River, uh, Genesis, and he put a rescue plan to bring us back to the intention, the outset, the reason God created. He's still on that, transforming. It's made up of true followers of Jesus Christ, the, day, the, they, the everyday ordinary people. Amen. It's a discipleship kingdom. Jesus' kingdom is for fully devoted, obedient followers of Jesus. You know, friends, the Great Commission, which we all talk about, and that song last night we sang about the Great Commission, just made me want to go even more. The last words of Jesus should be the first words we give our lives to if we truly think Jesus is who we think He is. Those are His words they matter most. Their last words, all authority on earth has been given to me. Now go and make disciples. We're so busy having church members and meetings and gatherings. Are we making disciples? The Great Commission does not command us to make converts of Christianity. We're making disciples of Jesus. Big difference. Converts change religions. Disciples change masters. Converts follow a system. Disciples follow a person. Converts build Christendom. Disciples build the kingdom of God. Converts embrace rituals. Disciples embrace a way of life. It's not some ritual we put on on Sundays. Those days are gone. This is a way of life we've chosen. Being called to live this day in and day out. When people see and don't see. When locked down and not locked down. Who cares? We live this life as followers of Christ. That's the Great Commission. Converts love conversion. Disciples love transformation. Amen. We're not about converting, about transforming. That's what it means to followers of Jesus, to make followers of Jesus. That's the great commission. So what are some of the signs of the kingdom? Well, clearly the sovereignty of Jesus. That's the most important sign of the kingdom. He is king, we're not. Amen. He is sovereign in all things. He is the main theme, the main ingredient of the kingdom. Without Him, we have no kingdom. The main son of the kingdom is Jesus because He's the king of His kingdom. All revolves around Him always, will always be, regardless of what we're going through. Another sign is the spreading of the good news. (laughs) Kingdom people, do you know what they do? They tell others about their king. Not about their church, not about their ministries, not about what they're a part of. They're king. I was invited into one of the biggest church planting arenas in America. I want to tell you the most gifted men and women I've ever met because this nation is gifted. I've lived in other countries. This nation, every person I meet can preach. And I'm saying they are it. It's just such a gifted nation. I'm wild by this nation. And I sat with these wonderful people and they... 
they began to give us statistics and talk around church planting in America. It was troubling how very few church plants are happening and how people aren't planting and why they're not planting and how we need to somehow get people to, to really kind of evangelize again. And if you're not a church planting grouping, then most people aren't even seeing converts happening in church. I mean, just the stats are scary and I'm not a stats guy. And then the one guy was talking about the gospel, and he said that, because we plant churches, that's kind of what we do all over the world. And so he got up and he said, oh, you know, statistics show us that people who are under 35 are winning less people to the Lord who plant churches than those who are 35 and over. And I'm like, no, he's got that very wrong. Because in my think, his young guys are radical. They're just getting on with it. It's old dudes. We are like, oh, I'm not sure, and tired, and 8 o'clock, I need to go to bed, you know, just... <laughs> The realities of life. So after the meeting, I went to him. I said, hey, bud, I appreciate what you said. I think you've got your stats wrong. They're the opposite. He said, no, I haven't. I said, no, I think you have. He said, no, I haven't. I said, listen, we do this for a living. He said, so do I. I said, okay, well, tell me how you get that. And he said, interesting for them, what they've found is people under 35 who plant churches are all about the social gospel. Take care of the poor. Feed them, clothe them, you know, and that's going to trick them into the kingdom. He said, people over 35, when they plant, they just rely on the power of the gospel. Like they actually just believe this gospel saves. And I thought, that's interesting. We can learn from both. So don't just sit there and preach a message. Go live it. But don't think you can buy them a sandwich and give them a blanket and think they're going to heaven. When you stop doing that, they're gone. Why? Because they're not saved into anything. They're just getting taken care of. So social gospel is great, but it's not the gospel. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God unto salvation. It still has the... Let me tell you, Americans can still get saved by this gospel. It's powerful enough to take the richest, a president, a prime minister, a king, and dethrone him and get him to acknowledge God. It can save that guy as much as it can save the person on the street who's desperate just for the next feed. And I know you know this, but somehow we don't believe it. So we want to trick them in and con them in and buy them a coffee and play this game when we actually have the good news of the king and this gospel, he's watching over this gospel. It saved you, my dear friend. It saved this heathen, radical sinner. It took me from what I was and made me something I could never be. And it wasn't a handout. It was a transformation. It's the gospel of God. He's still watching over his gospel. It's good enough. It doesn't need to be made sexy. It doesn't need some lipstick and a miniskirt to be more attractive to a generation who wants to die for something. And we're playing a game. Come and have pizza on a Wednesday and we'll talk about it and put a movie on. And when you really grow up, we'll tell you about Jesus. Come on, church. Pizza is bad. Thank you. If you're talking barbecue, then I'm in. But... You know, contextualization is a big talk right now. I want to tell you, contextualization is not making the gospel relevant. It's actually showing the relevance of the gospel. So we're privileged to lead an international, global... Uh, we have people having church and winning people literally under trees in Africa. As well as under the Eiffel Tower in Paris. In tents, in buildings, in cathedrals. This gospel, it works everywhere. It doesn't need to be made American to be an American thing. It doesn't need to be made gen, whatever your gens are now. I don't know what they are. What is it, gen A, back Z, D, I don't know. All I want to tell you is this, all right? You, you boomers, between boomers and gen Z. Uh, gen, Oh no, what are those millennials? You know, everyone's mad at millennials. Let me just say this. Between boomers and millennials, you irritate each other. That's fine. But we stuck in the middle of you two. Yeah. You know, we have X. Is it X? Yeah. We're there getting rubbed by both of you. So please, just get along so we can get on with this thing, right? <laughs> we don't need to make it relevant. Amen. I'm telling you, this gospel, you preach every heart globally from any culture, has the same back. Wow. They want this truth. Amen. But we're so clever. And we've, made, we've packaged it so well, it's no longer the gospel. 
And we wonder why when shakings happen, they're gone. It's because we gave them a false gospel, another gospel, rather than that gospel. Amen. Spreading of the good news. I literally had one of those meetings where they said, we've got to get like these evangelists in to come and stir the church again because we've not seen people saved. And so I was listening to these guys on and on and on. Eventually, I mean, listen, I'm just a visitor, so I'm nobody. I'm like, eventually, can I put my hand up a bit nervous? Like, oh, these are big gurus. They're all in suits, and I'm wearing my skinny jeans. This isn't going to go down well. <laughs> so I said, listen, guys, I mean, I, I, I realize I'm a guest to be invited by one of the guys just because of what we do globally. But I, 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 but I just said, I, I've got a solution. Like, if we just get the church in love with Jesus, like, I mean, if we just made much of Jesus in everything we do, surely the direct result would be that the church would automatically talk about Jesus. Yeah. I mean, isn't that what... Yeah, that's a great idea. Okay, thank you. Sit down. Okay, so how are we going to get the event? I mean, that was... And I was like, okay, well, that's fair enough. But that's why the church is in trouble. Yeah. We need the evangelist to come stir something that we all should be stirred by because of him. Yeah. See, whatever we praise gets... Repeat it. Whatever leaders say is important, that's what our people say. I just think we have a job to do to tell people about the king. Tell the church about the king so the king will, the church will tell the world about the king. Amen. Signs and wonders. Another sign. Oh, yeah, we get nervous. Yeah, let's get nervous. Amen. Jesus went about convincing and proving that he's alive. It's me. Put your hand there. Put your finger there. It's me. I was dead, but I'm alive. That, that's proving, convincing. It is me. Watch. He wants us to go about convincing and proving. Amen. Oh, it's called faith. Yeah, but demonstration. You know, if I can talk you into the kingdom, someone can talk you out of it. Yeah, that's so good. But when God demonstrates the kingdom, you're like, I either accept or reject, based not on a clever person, on a demonstration. Oh, God doesn't want to be tested. No, He doesn't want to be tested, but He wants to be revealed. And He wants to show His power to a world that talks about godliness with no power. Yeah. We the church, the, the worst thing we can do with power is pretend we don't have it. Yeah, wow. I'm not comfortable, so we just not go there. Because it's like, it's awkward. It's kind of weird. Jesus, God, yeah, God the Father, I get that. God the, the Son, yeah, okay, cool. Spirit stuff, uh, it's just weird. I've, had, I've been told it's wrong or... I've had bad experience, so tap out. That's not good. God's like, no, no, there's no options here. The Holy Spirit's not an optional extra for deluxe Christian. Amen. The Holy Spirit is not some power given by God. The Holy Spirit is God. Amen. If He was an add-on or a tag-on or a blessing from God, then we'd have the option to accept Him. But the fact He is God. 2 Corinthians 5.17, 5, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom, right? We all claim that we'll sing it, but I want to just tell you that's not true. Because the Spirit is right here, right now, and not all of us are free. The Spirit is everywhere, yet the whole world's not free. Why is that? Because it doesn't say where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. What it says is the Lord is the Spirit. And when the Spirit is received as Lord, that's where you find freedom. He's here. He doesn't need to come again. I, I know I'm speaking in the converted here. I listen to people say, oh, we need the Spirit to come. We need another Acts 2. We need the Pentecost to happen. I'm like, no, no. Pentecost happened. And if you don't believe it, then you can't believe any scripture. And interesting, the early church was birthed in power. And Jesus said, wait. Don't go do anything because you've been given authority, but now you need power. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes in you, and you'll be my witnesses, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. Wait for the power. Why? Because authority without power isn't good enough. Yeah. So we all walk around with authority, but we're not walking in power. Amen. And, and I know it's challenging because some of you have grown up, been taught it's wrong, it's obsolete, don't need it. How convenient. I, mean, I would rather just say we don't need that stuff. Psh, now we're all friends and no one's weird. <laughs> but how can God require of the Church, the modern church today in America, of what he required of the early church, but by the way, the power they had, I've taken it away. What kind of God would do that? And that just means more flesh. And just want to tell you, we do not need more flesh in the church. Amen. That's what's got us in trouble. Too much flesh, not enough spirit. He's taken his church back. 
And one of the signs is a demonstration of power. Not that we run after it, that it follows us. Signs and wonders should follow us. We should pray for the sick and God wants to break in with His kingdom and bring healing. And not through the evangelists who come and teach you formulas on how to do something that we already know what to do. Paul never went to a lesson on how to heal. On the road to Damascus, he encounters Jesus as a persecutor of the church. Encounters Jesus. Who are you, Lord, and what must I do? Blinded. He goes to there. He opens his eyes. And from that moment, he begins to pray for people, lay hands. And no one taught him how to do it. He didn't go to the lessons, the Randy Clark fire. I'm not fighting. I'm just saying we're waiting for conferences that are not allowed to happen right now. We're downloading stuff, which is great because you want to empower yourself and know how. But we get so good at knowing how, we forget to do. I know people who've been taught how to pray and then they're like, I can't remember the prayer, so I can't pray. Do you know Jesus? Yeah. Do you have authority? Yeah. Speak in His name. That's what they said. In the name of Jesus. That's all they said. Do you have that power? Yes. Rise up and walk. Not oh, gee, I, I, I'm not sure I know how to do this. Let me go back to the healer quickly and say, okay, tell me again. Oh, yes, that's right. There's a covenant and we have this covenant and he is. I'm not mocking it, but we get so caught up in that that we say, I don't fully get that, so I can't do that. The Lord's like, you're my people. Signs, wonders. People need to see my demonstration. Amen. Uh, you might be reluctant and retiring, but he has no retiring personality. He wants to display his splendor to a world that's famished for reality. And until the church rises up, God is going to have to use other people. But why not us? Not go after it. Let it follow you. Signs and wonders are not an end. They, 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 the, the, the signpost towards him. That's where we go wrong. When you're running after signs and wonders, it's all about a healing. It's got nothing to do with a healing. It's got everything to do with healing. Can I just say, if you're result-driven, it's probably why you're not seeing signs and wonders. Wow. Jesus healed out of compassion, not out of sign results. Yeah, that's good. Even winning souls. I mean, I'm scared of the language. It's not in the Bible. We won souls today. We're not soul winners. We seed dispensers. I think our problem is we don't see the results because we talk about results rather than understand our role to sow seed. So most of us are disappointed because we go out and we try and get people to be won over and they don't, we don't win them, so we're disappointed. Because our job is not to win anyone into anything. Our job is to just simply sow seed and leave the rest to God. Amen. I really do believe that. Yeah. That's why sometimes you encounter someone who's ready. You can say one word and they're like, I want to receive. Someone sowed that seed. Amen. You might have. This church could have sowed seed long before you, and now you're going to see. And so God works like that. Our job is just to disperse seed. Salvation through being born again. I mean, born again. Have you heard about that? Not for a while. Accept Jesus, invite him into your heart. He'll leave heaven and come live in your heart. Where does it say that? You can't leave in heaven and come. He's come, left heaven. He came, and now he's back there, and he's left his spirit. And his spirit lives in him. But we are changed. We're not bad dudes being made good. We're dead people being made alive. Amen. We want to know why people are not walking in what God intended. Because we've got them jumping through hoops to get to something He's already given them when they accept. Amen. Let's start there rather than start here and get you to jump through all this to get to there. You'll never get there. Yeah, Devil will make sure of that. So we wonder why most people won't minister or live in the thing. Because they have to be good to get good. Yeah. Rather than you are good because He made you. I keep saying, if this t-shirt was black, if it was red before now, and I dyed it, now it's black. I don't keep telling you it's a red shirt. It's black. Right? Why? Because it's no longer that. Oh, I'm a sinner. I'm just a beggar, founding beggar. I'm one beggar finding another beggar how to find bread. I mean, I love the humility, but that's not what the Bible says. You are born again. You're not who you were. You are a new creation. The old is gone. And we don't want to tell sinners that. We need the church to hear that. Amen. You don't start there. You start where he put you. His work. And I am a new creation. Racism, with all due respect, that we talk about. Can I just get in trouble? I don't have to repent for something I'm forgiven of. 
And let me just say, how dare someone get up and tell me I'm racist because they're struggling with racism. My color, my skin color makes me racist. I'm not. I'm a new creation. I don't have to, every time that word comes up, get on my knees and repent. I no longer am that person. So stop telling me to repent on behalf of my forefathers and grandfathers and every other father if it's not me. Can I, can I say, that's old covenant thinking. We wonder why we're not living in the new covenant. Jesus is the mediator. He's the one we look to. Righteousness is in Him, not in stuff we do. But somehow we put stuff we do on people like old covenant forgetting Christ. Jesus comes and he, he is righteousness. Therefore, encountering Him, I receive His righteousness. That's what happened to Paul. Righteousness exalts a nation, we all claim. That's not what we should be preaching. Jesus makes us right, therefore, that's what God's about. Not we need to get the government to be righteous for God to bless the nation. No, no. We need to come to Christ and find righteousness in Him through the new covenant. And He's the one we put on. So we need those people to find Jesus, not to be made right in what they do. Does that make sense? I know I'm throwing rocks here, and you, but I'm just trying to challenge this. We mix old and new together, and we wonder why we're confused. The Old Covenant matters, and the Old Testament is in Scripture. We need it, but it's got to be through the lenses of Jesus. Everything. If my people call by name, my name will humble themselves and pray and seek your faith. I mean, it's the most quoted Scripture in the American church, but it's Old Covenant truth in a context. I'm not saying we shouldn't do that, but we're all repenting for stuff we've not done because that's what God needs us to do. It makes us feel good, but God's not looking for repentance so He can move. I look at the New Testament. Paul didn't walk in and say the strategy today is we all get on our knees and repent in the city on behalf of the city, then God moves. Paul arrives in that city and he declares the kingdom of God and preaches and they fall to their knees. What must we do to be saved? It's the declaration, the demonstration. It's the kindness of God that leads us to repentance. But we've kind of put the horse, the cart before the horse. Repent so God comes. What about God comes so we repent? Amen. And I know this is freaking people out. But I'm just saying I, I want to be true to Scripture. That stuff sounds good. That stuff makes me feel bad. And then when I get on my knees, it makes me feel good. So that's what I want. But God says, I don't want that. Jesus makes you right. So you want to fix this nation? It's not repent on behalf of your forefathers and angry fathers and this. And you know, I'm an American, even though I have an accent. If you're racist, repent. But go to Jesus and get repent. And then stop apologizing on behalf of other people. Just be. Don't tell people you're not racist. Just love all people. And I don't even think it's right. I think it's we all carry discrimination to people. We all do. We can't have discrimination at any level. Not skin color, not makeup, not identity, all this stuff. And if you do have that, repent. But don't keep repenting because you don't need to repent of something you've forgiven of. Does that make sense? I mean, I, I <laughs> you know, my dad, I mean, just if I can, gee, we got nowhere again. Sorry, bro. But I'm trying to get to my points. We haven't got to one point yet. That's okay. We won't. Good news is I'll give Chris this afternoon session, so. You won't have to hear me again today, maybe tonight. But so I, 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 I was born in Africa, and I lived in South Africa for a while. My dad was an evangelist. I was born in Zimbabwe, Rhodesia, six weeks there. My dad was an evangelist, knocking on doors and inviting people to come here about Jesus, set a tent and preach. And then uh, I was born in Rhodesia, and, and then six weeks later, we moved to South Africa. And in South Africa, let me just tell you this, and I'm sorry, I know some here go, South Africa was a racist country. I just want you to know, that's racist. They had literally taken the, the Bible and twisted it to say that white people are more important than black people. And we had a system around that truth. And I, I'm telling you, that was racist. But my pops, my dad, would not play the game. We are equal. And so we had the secret police. We had, in those days, we, apartheid, you guys had banned us. America wanted nothing. We weren't allowed to have anything because of our racist government and so on. We were taught we were better people than anyone else. We are white power. Honestly, it's tragic. 
But we were not allowed to be that. My dad would never. We had people of other color before it was legal. We had the cops phoning, secret police tapping the phone. I'm not trying to, this way, my dad would not play that. He had people of all color in our house. I mean, again, he had them on his team ministering and everything else. And it was against what was spoken of. But we had some of your wonderful speakers come speak to us racist South Africans. My dad invited them to come preach to all these leaders. And they were of different color. Come and tell us how racist we are. And they would stand up in our conferences and say, you South Africans are racist. And you are needing to repent on behalf. Otherwise, God's going to bring bloodshed to this nation. And my dad, I mean, he's a courageous leader, but he's got these gifted preachers from this great country telling, and he could get up and, and this, this one African-American pastor, leader said, you all need it. All white people in this room, get on your knees and repent. And my dad picked up the microphone from that guy. said, I, I just want to stop this for a minute. He said, I, I want you to know something. I am not going to get on my knees and repent for something I'm not. I might be white, but I'm not a racist. If you're a racist, you get on your knees and repent. But you don't get on your knees and repent for something you're not. I want to give you the freedom in this room. Now, you know how offended that pastor was, but my dad was, I'd rather offend this man than allow this man, in his desire to be biblical, put stuff on my people. That will put them under pressure to feel bad for something they didn't do. And he took the mic. He said, if you're racist of any sort, get on your knees. If you're not, I'm not. I'm not going to get on my knees. I'm repented. I'm not that. I've never been there. And I want to tell you, that took courage, but it liberated a people. And I don't know what to say, but be careful that you don't allow everything coming at us. Don't react to it. Just don't carry something God's released you of. And we as leaders in the church need to protect our people more than we need to identify with that culture. You know, pastors in this room will stand before God for their people, not for what they did in their cities. God's entrusted you people, shepherds, to take care of. Read 1 Peter chapter 5. Your job is to take care of the sheep, serving them and overseers and bishops, all this. And when the chief shepherd appears, he says, you'll receive your reward. But we so want to identify with and be relevant to the culture and put stuff on social media to say we're not that, that we're putting stuff on our people. I want to be a man of truth. I want to lead through Scripture. And if I've got issues, I want to deal with them. But I don't want to put my issues on people. And God forbid I'll allow others to put things on the people of God when He set us free from those things. And it's on anything. Because what's next is another thing coming our way that we are. And there's another thing and another thing. And you can play the game and be a chameleon to try and protect everyone and be everyone. Or you just be free to say, I'm not that. I won't repent for that. I'll call it out if I need to. If I have that heart, I'll deal with it. But I'm not allowing stuff to be put on me and try to think I can serve God in the process. Is that, is that all right? Very touchy subject. I get that. And those are watching might misrepresent. I'm just telling you, God wants His people. For it was for freedom that Christ has set you free. What did Paul say? And he goes on and he says, And don't allow those to put, uh, put you back in bondage. Do not allow the yoke of slavery to be put back on you. Do not allow even good things that sound great, that make you feel bad, that make you feel good, to be put on you, to restrict you. You are not that. You're born again. Amen. Not a bad person. You're a born again, new creation. I'm not that person, so stop referring to that person. I'm a new creation, and I want to walk in all that God has. And is it just in my thought pattern, my thinking, Romans chapter 12, uh, conform to the pattern of this world anymore? All that's happening, but I'm not that dude who has to keep going back to repent. I'm a new person. Uh, I hope that's Helpful, not just for you, for even people who are of other color, other identity. We are all equal. Under the blood, there is no higher. We are chosen people, royal priesthood, holy nation. 
People declaring praises of a God who were called out of darkness into His wonderful light. All priests, all equal. Those who don't know Jesus are equal. As those of us who do, they just need Christ. They need to be born again. But please don't repent for something you know. Please, you owe it to be free. Otherwise, what did Jesus do on the cross? He doesn't keep going back to the cross to be killed again and again so we can repent again and again. Showing peace, suffering. So in other words, invite people not to only hear the good news, but to actually be the good news. Another one is suffering. Oh, we don't like to talk about this, but that's a sign of the kingdom. Suffering to those who seek to advance the kingdom of God. That's a sign of the kingdom. Suffering. Oh, I'm a kingdom person. about the suffering thing? Mm. It's there. Read it. Showing peace and mercy to the lost and kindness of the poor. That's another sign of the kingdom. It's not just the, the glitz and the glamour and the signs and the wonders. It's showing peace. Being people of peace. Are you a peacemaker? Are you? Are you throwing rocks and hand grenades and bombing it up and blowing it? Or are you a peacemaker? Blessed are the peacemakers. Hello, friends. We need to show peace, mercy to the lost, kindness to the poor. That's a sign of the kingdom. Lastly, I'll land with this. We need to be starting kingdom communities. Multiplication. This is not a kingdom of addition. It's multiplication. See, a church without a kingdom vision eventually always becomes selfish and self-serving. You might have good intentions, start well. We might have come out of the season going, okay, it's about the kingdom. It's all about that, and then we get busy with our thing. And when you stop being about the kingdom, you become selfish, and the church becomes self-serving. What's in it for me? What ministries are for me and my children? What have you got for me? What if I come to the meeting? And we have prayer meetings. People say, well, if I come to prayer, what's in it for me? I'm like nothing. If the reason you're coming so you can get something, you're the wrong person. Now, it's everything's in it for you, but nothing is in it. It's not a direct, it's an indirect place. And every great church seems to lose its way because it starts being about the church and the ministry and the people, and it takes its eyes off a kingdom. Eventually, every church that is not kingdom will become self serving and selfish. Every movement, every stream, every denomination becomes focused on administrating and keeping it going rather than getting on with the kingdom and doing away with stuff as we find seasons in God. What's kingdom, what's not? This is a time where everything that can be shaken will be shaken. And that which stands is the kingdom. I came to speak on ministry that matters, and I didn't get to it. But I want to tell you, we need to come back to what matters. And there's no tricks. There's no guessing. I wonder what it is. It's the king and the kingdom. That's what matters. That's what cannot be shaken. That's what we've been saved into. That's what God is on about. This king's business requires haste. So would you with me not make it about us? Would you with me not look to what's in it for me? Would we not go to God and say, you're holding out on me. Let's go to God and say, all that I've been entrusted for with is yours. The people I've been given are yours. The churches, the buildings, the finances, the dimes, the dollars, the people, the anointings, what I carry. It's all for a purpose that's way beyond here on earth. And it matters more. And I want to make much of you Christ. And I also want to advance your kingdom here on earth. Which means my hands are open to release and receive. But I will never shut my hands to keep something that does not belong to me. And I won't try and advance something that's not advancing in me. I won't try and give something I haven't got. I will surrender and submit all the time to the rule and reign of God. I will allow order in the midst of chaos. I will yield only in the kingdom does surrender bring victory. Everywhere else, when you Raise the white flag in surrender means you defeat it. But in the kingdom of God, when that white flag goes up to say, I surrender, it's there, my dear friend, that you find your victory day in and day out. 
I won't fight you. I'll surrender. I'll allow the rule and reign of God in me, through me, with me. I'll speak truth in love, but truth. I'll not be a chameleon and pick a choose a team when I'm with that. I'm going to be that same person. I represent a king and I'm part of a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And that which needs to be shaken, shake it, Lord. Please reveal what's really inside. So this side of eternity, I can fix it. The shaking's good. Reveals. Shows. God's so good to us. He'll show us things. So we can change them before it's too late. And I'm so grateful in ministry. He's shaken some stuff for me to say, waste of time. Don't go back there. Go for the things I'm doing. Let's close our eyes, please. Is it right if I pray, Marco? King Jesus. You are worthy of it all. It's not just a song. It's not even just a declaration. That is our heart's desire. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things. To you are all things. Therefore, you do deserve the glory. Thank you for rescuing us from the dominion of darkness. That is, that is good enough, but even better. You've rescued us from, you've transferred us from into a kingdom. Your kingdom that cannot be shaken. Whom we have redemption by your son. We're no longer who we were. I pray this morning that, that we would live in that space. That we would be aware that there are real things and real issues and people are facing real stuff. And we, we don't want to fuel that and be a part of coming against those things. We, we want to be peacemakers. But we also don't want to carry things that are not from you. We want to be free. It's for freedom, Christ, you've set us free. Stand firm in your freedom. It's not a feeling, Jesus. Freedom is a person. And that's you, Jesus. So everything we face, everything that's put on us, we, we want to see it through you. You are my righteousness. You are my peace. You are my joy. You are my strength. You are my life giver. You are my way. You are my truth. Amen. You are my life. Amen. You are my way to the Father. Amen. There's no way to God but through you, Jesus. Yes, Salvation is found in nothing, no church, no ministry, no person, no gifting, no government. Salvation is found in no other name but in your name. Salvation belongs to you, God. Amen. And you've chosen your son, Jesus, your only son, Amen. to leave all of heaven, to give up the joys of that kingdom, to come and reveal the kingdom of heaven to us, to live this life fully God, but fully man, restricted as a man, to show us we can live. To be an example of true kingdom life. To mix with people we wouldn't mix with. To, sh to connect with things we wouldn't connect. To do things we'd never dream of. And then you went to the cross to purchase us with your blood. And then you were raised from the dead. And then you showed us life after your death. 
And you carried on with kingdom, preaching the kingdom, carried on with kingdom ministry. You didn't change it after your death. You kept preaching for 40 days the kingdom of God. You demonstrated, you healed, you restored, you revealed yourself. And then you called your followers and you said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Now go and make disciples, followers of Jesus all over. Teaching them to obey. Teaching them to Love me enough to do what I say. And surely I'm with you always till the end of age. And then you left this mandate and you said, I will send a helper. It's better for you that I go. Because if I don't go, then I can't send the helper. So you've given us power. You've given us the model. You've given us the message. You've given us all that we need, and you've given us you. We want to walk in all of it. In this time, in this season, we want to be about the king's business. Help me and us to line up as your church that reflects you. May we walk in victory. May we show your power. May we demonstrate you are alive and well. As we grow in revelation of you, we pray. Bless these friends in this room. In Jesus' name.